We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Who's excited to be in God's house this morning, right? Hey, I'm really glad that you're here. We're in a series called I Will Build My Church and we're talking about the church. This thing that Jesus said he was going to build, and we're, going to, we're studying that over the next few weeks, and I'm really glad that you're here. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and I'm really glad you're here. Maybe after service, we can uh, meet out in the lobby or outside somewhere. I'd love to do that. Uh, we're, we're going through this series, like I said, called I Will Build My Church. It comes from Matthew chapter 16. It's a direct quote from Jesus. In verse 18, he says, now I say to you, right, he's talking to Peter, right? He says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, here it is, I will build my church. So he's talking about this thing called the church that we're a part of. We're, we're studying what that means. And he goes on to even say, he says, and the powers of hell will not be able to conquer it. Nothing is going to be able to stop this thing. 2,000 years later, here we are, a church gathered together, and, and hell has not been able to conquer it. We're continuing to see God do incredible things through this body of Christ called the church. And today, we're going to explore this concept that we see all throughout the New Testament called a church family. Uh, there's, it's one of the, the metaphors that's used in Scripture when, when Jesus is trying to describe this thing called the church we oftentimes see this, this phraseology, right, uh, of a family. We hear brothers and sisters. In fact, when I was in Ecuador a couple weeks ago, we were on a short-term missions go adventure. And uh, while we were at a church on Sunday morning, we went into an Ecuadorian church. And before we got there, one of our missionaries was telling us, here's some different things that you can say when you're greeting people as you walk into church. And so we're learning some different, you know, Spanish phrases. You know, one of them, you could say, Dios te bendiga, which means God bless you, right? You could say, uh, you could say, uh, uh, buenos dias, just real simple, good morning. But they said the actual preference would be, what well, you shake a hand in Ecuador and you say, hermano to a guy or hermana to a girl, which means brother and sister. It's real simple, you don't have to wish them a good morning. You don't have to have, uh, say, God bless you. All you have to do is shake their hand and recognize in that moment that you are my brother in Christ. You are my sister in Christ. And it's simple. I'm like, I'm ready for this. I'm walking in, hermano, hermano, hermana. And they're saying the same thing to me. And we recognize, we don't even speak the same language we've never met before, but I'm meeting all sorts of new brothers and sisters. It's so cool. And, and the Bible talks about the church as a family. A reminder that the church is not a building, it's not an address, it's not a place you go to. It's a place that when other people that are brothers and sisters in Christ come together, you, listen, we could all just say, hey, let's go over to Brewster's right now. The church would be over there. And it wouldn't be here anymore. Wherever we go, the church goes because we are the church. And so we're this church family. So this concept of a family we see it really powerfully in Ephesians chapter 2. So if you brought a Bible with you today, open up to Ephesians chapter 2. If you don't own a Bible, no big deal. We want you to have one, though, because it's the best book you'll ever read. So grab one underneath the chair in front of you, write your name on it, and take it home with you. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is, is speaking, and he says about Jesus, he says, he brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. He says, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. Here it is. He says, you are members of God's family. 
And to understand that this word Gentiles, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, we had this group of people called the Jewish people, God's chosen holy people, and they were pretty special. All throughout the Old Testament, God's chosen people. And this word Gentile is a word that basically means everybody else. So you're either Jewish or you're Gentile. And, and now because Jesus sent his son to die on the cross, those who place their faith in him, we all have the same Holy Spirit inside of us. And therefore now it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, doesn't matter if you're Gentile, we're all members of God's family if we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what Paul's trying to explain, that we're supposed, uh, as a church, we're supposed to act like family. We're supposed to be family. What, what comes to mind when you think of family? Some of us, when we're like, we're supposed to act like family, well, you've never met my family. And you know, like, when you think of family, some of you have a big smile that comes across your face, and you're thinking, man, I love my family. I love being around them. Man, if a church is supposed to operate like that, that tells me a lot about how healthy a church is supposed to be. But some of you, I say family, and you're thinking, I don't really think the church should operate like that. That's pretty gross, right? Some of you, maybe you think of something else. Maybe, maybe when I say the word family, you think of something weird like, uh, like I do, like the lyrics to the, uh, uh, it's an old sitcom called Cheers. You guys know Cheers? Raise your hand if you know Cheers. The lyrics to the theme song, right? When I hear lyrics like this, if I start singing them, I bet you'll start singing along, right? Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, you know it, right? That's awesome. Listen, listen. So this song is about people who, after a long day and their, their troubles and their work and whatever, they want to come together to a place where they're known, where people care about them, where they can retreat to. How unfortunate, though, is it that they had to find this at a bar together, that they couldn't find a place of retreat and comfort at home? I don't know about you, but at the end of a long day, my place of retreat where I want to go and be known and loved is my home. It's my family. And so this concept of family, it's, it's kind of a, everyone thinks of something a little different, but the truth is the Bible actually shows us what a healthy family looks like. And if we could take those principles of what is a healthy, you know, uh, regular husband, wife, children kind of family, if, if we know what a healthy version of that looks like, we can apply that to the church. What does that look like for the church? And uh, it, it's important because family, uh, when we were wrapping up our trip to Ecuador, we were all sitting in a big circle. There's 22 of us, and we were taking turns sharing, essentially, what does it look like? Uh, what, what, what has God shown you? What, what is a what, what has God taught you during this experience while we were in Ecuador together? And one of the overarching themes while we're sitting there and we're all talking, one of the overarching themes was people who said simply, I feel like we've become family. You know why that is? It's because we shared a goal. We had something bigger than ourselves. We were all kind of focused on something big and important, which is really powerful. And even this, get, get this, we all were like communal living. We all kind of were willing to sacrifice to make things happen. It was, it was pretty awesome. And so we're sitting there in this environment, sacrificing for each other, making sure that everybody was part of this thing that was bigger than ourselves. And at the end of the day, it made us realize that we were a family. We were brothers and sisters in Christ. And the same is true in the church. You are part of something bigger than yourself. God has a purpose for us that's bigger than us. And when we recognize that together and we do life together and we, we get you know, dirty together, right? When we get into the, the, the fishing boat and we recognize that we've all been called to this mission, you're going to recognize the beauty of family, what it's meant, what God means when he says the church is meant to act like a family. I had a, uh, an apple tree in the side yard of my house growing up. My dad planted an apple tree. And I remember year after year, we were just hoping that one day this tree would grow apples. 
It seemed to make sense. One day we're going to be able to go out and this tree's going to get big enough and we're going to be able to pick apples off. It's going to be great. And it got to the point where we're supposed to be producing apples and every once in a while I would grow these little weird apple shaped little like ball type things, but they would just like shrivel up and fall off and die. And I'm like, what is wrong with our apple tree? And someone recommended, well, why don't you put some rose bushes next to it? So my dad did. He put a whole row of rose bushes. And it was amazing how that next season, we started getting apples. Because, listen, you can, be, uh, you can be planted in the right soil. You can be in the right place. I believe this is a, a healthy place to plant yourself. I, I wouldn't be the pastor here if I didn't think this was a healthy place to get plugged into God's Word. And I think you can get plugged in and be planted in a good place, but just trying to figure out how to, to grow and thrive without other people around you. See, the truth is when you put rose bushes around an apple tree, you, get, you track bees and then the pollination all happens and everything. And before you know it, everything starts flourishing. And the same is true. God calls us to do life with one another as family. And if you don't, if you try to do it on your own, you're going to be, you're going to grow. The tree got bigger every year. It had leaves, but it wasn't growing any fruit. It wasn't thriving. And so if we want to thrive, we got to do life together as family. And so let's explore what that means. First, think about this thought. The church needs you, and you need the church. You can live alone, but you can't thrive alone. God, I ask right now that you would teach each of us something really powerfully out of your word today. Help us to see how we can treat each other more like family. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect church. We talked about that last week. There's also no such thing as a perfect family. Can I get an amen? <laughs> right? There's no such thing as a perfect family. You know, one of the times that we can highlight the fact that our families are really messed up one of probably the, the seasons of the week, the one of the moments of the week that's like the most argument, uh, you're yelling at each other, we're saying mean things to each other, is on the, the way from your home to church on Sunday mornings. Isn't that true? In fact, I've learned a secret. If you want to figure out how to get from home to church without any arguments in the car, it's really simple. You just drive separately. It's perfect. I've been doing that for eight years now. I get here a little earlier than the rest of my family. No arguments. It's great. It's perfect. There's no perfect family. Our families aren't, aren't perfect, so we're not trying to figure out what does a perfect family look like, but what does a good and healthy family look like? And so we got some points for you to write down. Uh, the first point is this. A healthy family prioritizes one another. A healthy family prioritizes one another. Simply put, they prioritize each other over and above those outside of the family. And that, that might sound like it makes sense in your family. I can imagine that when you bring home your paycheck, right, you recognize, I'm going to pay my family, uh, I'm going to make sure our family's bills are paid for before I pay for my neighbor's bills, right? You kind of recognize that you have a priority. But sometimes in the church, we forget that God's called us to act like family. And it makes, a, it sounds weird for a pastor to say, listen, we're supposed to actually prioritize our love and care and concern for each other within the body of Christ before we prioritize the needs of those outside of the body of Christ. You might think, well, that doesn't make sense. Aren't we supposed to care far more about people who are lost, that are out in the world, that are going to hell? Uh, shouldn't they be our primary concern? Well, let me show you what Scripture says. When it's talking about the family in 1 Timothy 5.8, it says, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. So now this verse is Paul writing to Timothy about the actual family unit, okay? But then we see the same thing about the church in Galatians 6, verse 10. It says, therefore, whenever you have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. No, no, don't miss this first part. You are called to, to show love and to be good and to be a light to everyone, not just inside the church, but don't miss the last part of this verse. It says, especially to those in the family of faith. So while we are certainly called to do good things outside of the family of faith, 
we should especially have a higher level of care and concern for brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what the Bible says. Just like family. We're a church family, and we're supposed to prioritize one another. Throughout the the New Testament, when you go into this book, the last quarter of the Bible we call the New Testament, Matthew, the book of Matthew, all the way through the book of Revelation, you're going to find 59 times that the New Testament has what we call the one another verses of Scripture. The one another's. Uh, And they're verses specifically about how brothers and sisters in Christ are supposed to treat other brothers and sisters in Christ. I'll I'll share a few with you. I don't have time to go through all 59. We, We see that you're supposed to bear one another's burdens. You're supposed to love one another. You're supposed to show hospitality to one another. You're supposed to be devoted to one another. You're supposed to honor one another. You're supposed to instruct one another. There's all sorts of verses throughout the New Testament that show us Listen, when you are part of the family of faith, you should treat other people in the family of faith with a higher level of priority. Make sure, if you've only got a little bit of care and concern to give out, that you're first and foremost making sure that your family is taken care of. That's scripture. The early church had this figured out really well. When you look in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Right when the church was starting to grow, right? Jesus said to Peter, you're Peter and you're the rock and on this rock I'm gonna build my church. And then this, this church started growing right there in Acts chapter two. And you see right at the end of Acts chapter two, it says that all the believers had everything in common. And what that means is, is that whatever one believer had, they didn't consider it theirs anymore. They said, I'm part of a family now, a family of believers. So whatever I have, you have. I saw this meme the other day. It said, mi casa es su casa, but mi taco es mi taco. <laughs> I love it. But in the early church, right? Mi casa es su casa. Mi taco es tu casa taco, right? Like anything I have, if a brother or sister in Christ, let me just put it with the family, right? If I've got something, you know, when I bring home a paycheck, and one of my girls, one of my daughters needs something, I don't go like, get your own job. <laughs> like, no. Like, Molly's 11, right? I don't like, no, I'm sorry, this is mine. I'm buying stuff I want. You go get your own, right? I don't do that. I see that she has a need, and I want to take care of it. And in the body of Christ, we ought to care about each other that same way. We, we operate these one another's. We hold all things in common. We care about each other. We bear each other's burdens. I had an older brother. I still have an older brother. I didn't outpace him. Um, I have an older brother, and growing up, my brother, he he was a bit of a a, a tool. Remember we used that word last week? He was a bit of a jerk to me. I mean, he was two years older than me. He was bigger than me. And I remember I'd come home from school, and I'd make like an after-school snack. You know, I'd put like Tostina pizza rolls or something in the oven. I'm like, ooh, I'm so excited. I'd wait the 10 minutes. Those bad boys would come out, and my brother would just come, thank you, and push me out of the way and grab all my pizza rolls and be like, make some more. Like, he was just, he wasn't very nice. But I remember when someone else outside of the family ever picked on me. Then my brother was like, okay, hold on. I'm the only one who picks on him. Right? It was like he would step into this protector role and say, nobody messes with my family. And, and while he certainly wasn't an incredible example of a real healthy brother, in those moments, it was incredible to see how he, he just said, yeah, my family's my priority. Here's the second thing healthy families have in common. They spend time together. They spend time together. You can't get around it. You might think, well, I don't really enjoy spending time with my family. I would say, well, you don't have a healthy one. I mean, because that's, at the end of the day, healthy families enjoy spending time together. They enjoy doing things together, going on vacations together, eating together, all those things. In fact, your family, in a healthy version, you have kind of your default social circle. Like, and that's totally cool with me. I, I, my wife is my best friend. Like, unapologetically, there are times when other friends want to spend time with me, and I'm like, oh, I'd rather spend time with you. Like, I'd rather spend time with my family. They're just kind of like my, my closest, we, we count down to like vacations together. We enjoy spending time together. 
And I think that should be true in a healthy family. In Hebrews 10, verse 25, it says, and let us, we're talking about the church, not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. A couple things I love about this verse. Number one, it says really clearly that we're all supposed to not neglect meeting together. That's what we're doing right now. All of you, great job. You get a star, right? Name on the board with a star. Good job. We're all here. We're, we're not neglecting meeting together. I love how it then goes on to say, as some people do. <laughs> you guys look around. You know who they are. They're not here today. You call them, okay? Here, here's what it, it ends, though. It says, as the day of, of Jesus' return is getting closer, it actually becomes more important that we gather together. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. He might come back before I finish this message, okay? He might come back a thousand years from now. I have no idea. But what I do know is that his return is closer today than it was yesterday. It is more important today for us to, to not forsake gathering together as a church family than it was yesterday. And it was important yesterday. It's more important today. It'll be more important tomorrow that we do this thing called gathering together and spending time together. While I recognize that it's important to have, we, we all have friends outside of our family. I have friends outside of my family. I have friends outside of the church, you know. We all have, and I think that's healthy. It's good to have people that you're building relationships with. That you can be a light in their life. You can point them to Jesus in your relationship with them. That's great. One rule of thumb that we have in my family, I tell my girls, listen, it's great to have friends who don't know Jesus. But make sure your best friend your closest friendships are brothers and sisters in Christ. Because when you are struggling through a season, when not, you listen, if, if I were having an, a marriage moment and we were just getting on each other's nerves and I'm thinking all sorts of lies and I went to someone who doesn't know Jesus for advice, they're probably gonna be like, oh man, I had that same thing happen to me, just ditch her. But if I go to a brother or sister in Christ, right, they're gonna say, man, are you an idiot? You're, you, you, your wife is amazing. You need to turn around and you need to go back and you need to get on your knees and you need to apologize. See, a brother or sister in Christ is gonna give you godly wisdom and tell you the truth when the, the, a non-believer is not gonna necessarily point you to truth. So we wanna make sure that our closest friends, the people that we're closest with, are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We wanna spend time together. The way we do that around here is Sunday mornings. One of the primary ways we worship together, we tether our, the Holy Spirit in each of us gets tethered together and our worship is more powerful when we worship corporately. Even more important than Sunday mornings, I would say, is life groups. When you gather together with a life group and you, you intentionally know each other and work out those one another's of the New Testament together, what a powerful way to, to spend time together. First John 1 7 says, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then, here it is, we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. All right, here's a third thing. Healthy families share common goals. If you're part of a healthy family at home, one of the ways you'll know that is your family is kind of moving in the same direction. You all kind of have an understanding of what uh, where you're trying to move to, what you're trying to accomplish, and you all have a share a, and share a common goal, and you encourage each other towards accomplishing your goals. The same, by the way, is true in the church. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, it says this, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. And then it says this, let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. What Paul is saying to the church in Corinth is, listen, if you're gonna be a healthy church family, you're gonna have a unity around a common purpose. You're gonna all be moving in the same direction, trying to accomplish the same purposes. You know, that's true, in a family as, as it is here in the church. We're gonna have a singular vision and we're all gonna move in the same direction. Let me tell you how we do that around here. 
Once a year, our overseers, we call them overseers, they're like elders of our church, we gather together for a retreat together, and we come up with a one to five year vision. There's a direction, some coordinates that we're, we're, we're excited. We believe that God is asking us to take this fishing boat called the church and move us from point A to point B. And there's a vision. And then that vision gets cast down to the staff of this church and say, listen, the elders of our church believe that Jesus, who's the head of the church, is asking this church to move together from here to there. And so we put together what we call wigs, wildly important goals. This year, our church has 10 wigs. If you came to Vision Sunday last year, you know what those are. You're going to hear about them again at the end of August. Um, But our 10 wildly important goals, those are 10 things that our staff is working on to accomplish this year because we believe God has directed us to move in that direction. And so it's important that as a church family that we are all excited about and moving towards the same place together because healthy families share common goals. You know, when we're talking about these common goals, it's also important to realize that it's important to have clearly defined roles and, and boundaries. In other words, in a healthy family, everyone kind of knows whose role is whose. Who's going to take care of this? You know, one of the roles I learned about really early in my marriage, I didn't know this was a thing, right? But I learned very early that at nighttime, when I get into the bed and my wife gets into the bed, if the lights of the master bedroom are still on, I figured out that it is my role. It doesn't matter if I got in bed first. It doesn't matter if my wife is walking by the light switch to the bed. She will walk right past it and get in bed and say, the lights are on, (laughs) right? But see, in a healthy family, you recognize someone's going to be in charge of taking out the trash. Someone's chore is this on Wednesdays, and someone else has this to do on Thursdays, and someone's going to do this, and that that person's going to earn some money, and this person's going to do that, and this, whatever. There's some clearly defined roles. And within the church, that happens to be true also, Every one of us who's part of this family, brother or sister in Christ, there's something that God has given you to do here. And when you don't do your role, you know, the the sink backs up and the the dishwasher, you know, the, the laundry doesn't get, something is not getting done or someone else is having to work double time to make up for the role that you aren't doing. There's clearly defined roles. There's also clearly defined boundaries. Everyone knows within their role how far they can go, at what point they need to get permission to whatever. And the same is true at this church. We have processes and systems in place. They're not just because we like a bunch of rules. It's because we want to operate as a healthy church family. And so there's certain things that we, we, we know, like, hey, if you want to rent this space, you go through this, and you fill out this form, and you do this, and you do that. And there's just a system because a healthy family has those things in place. Let me show you um, one of those roles that you're going to learn about or hear, know, already know about in church is the role of, of leadership within the church. Like at this church, we, we know first and foremost that the Bible is really clear that Jesus is the head. He's in charge. If Jesus wants us to do anything within the church, we're going to do that. But then under Jesus, within the, the, the organization of this church, we have this board I was telling you called overseers who serve as the elders of our church. They're who I answer to, right? They're, they're my authority. They have authority over my, my job, uh, my pay, all that. I mean, I answer to them. They tell us as a church, here's what we're trying to accomplish, and then we go and we, we do those things together. So there's this role of leadership within the church, and here's what it says about leadership in a real family or in a, uh, you know, mother, husband, children family. It says in Exodus 20, honor your father and mother, and then you will live long, a long full life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. We understand the power in a, in a family unit of obeying your father and mother, that it brings health to you. But we also see this And you're going to see this all throughout Scripture. When God has something to say about the family unit, He's going to also apply it to the church because the church is like a family. It says in Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey your spiritual leaders 
and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Love that. Give them reason. Listen, the leaders of this church, like I I consider myself one of the leaders of this church, I'm going to do this job. I can do it with joy or I can do it begrudgingly. And boy, does Scripture say, do what you can to make sure your leaders, your life group leader, your ministry leader, your elders, your overseers, that they are able to lead in a way that they can do it with joy as we all move together towards a common goal. Because healthy families share common goals. Here's the fourth thing. Healthy families help each other grow. Healthy families help each other grow. In my family, I want to do everything I can to help my wife and my children grow into Christ-likeness. One day I believe I'm going to stand before God and have to give an account for whether or not I led my family the way God asked me to. And so within the church family, the same applies. We are called to help each other grow. You know, in, in Scripture, there's, there's words like discipline and discipleship. And if you notice, discipline and discipleship all have really the same root word. There's this concept in Scripture that we are supposed to, not only in our family, but in the church, we're supposed to discipline and disciple one another towards Christ-likeness. It says in Hebrews 12, It says, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. Let's say if it's not painful, your parents aren't doing it right, all right? But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living, For those who are trained in this way. So we understand this concept of discipline and discipleship from a perspective of it's a good thing. God wants us to grow and and, and improve out of our our issues and our problems and become more like Jesus. It says in Proverbs 22, 6 to parents, it says, direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. The fathers, it says in Ephesians 6, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them, rather bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. There's no doubt that throughout Scripture we see that it's obvious that God is calling uh, uh, fathers and mothers and, and within the family unit that God's calling us to, to train each other up. That we're, we're, we're all trying to make each other better. And even when I make a mistake, my children... Uh, I I can recognize that and grow from it. I can become a better father when I screw it up, which happens all the time. And so within the church family, we also can help each other grow. One of the ways, I say one of the ways, five of the ways we do that, and we have these things called our five catalysts. And a catalyst is simply that thing that when you're doing a chemistry thing and you pour something in, that last little thing, the catalyst, is what makes the the reaction happen. It's what makes the foams, you know, explode and the, the fire or the, you know, whatever, the color chain, whatever, that last little thing. The catalyst is what we recommend that when you do this as part of our church family, you're going to grow. Right on the other side of this wall, we call it our catalyst hallway. And there's five posters hanging up. Right now they're covered up for Kid Venture Week. But normally you can see what our five catalysts are, right? To worship regularly. To be here in this space is one of the ways you're going to grow. To connect relationally in a smaller group called a life group, right? To grow personally, to learn how to feed yourself God's word on your own, to serve sacrificially, and to give generously. When you do these five things, you are going to grow. And when we help each other in this family do these five things, we help each other grow. You know, when a baby is born, we don't expect a baby to just come out running, right? A baby first has to learn how to roll over, and then that baby might learn how to sit up, and then that baby will learn how to crawl, and then that baby will learn how to walk, and then that baby will learn how to run. And the same is true in the Christian life. Some of you, I mean, we had so many baptisms last week that some of you are just beginning your relationship with Jesus. 
And you're going to have to learn how to sit up before you learn how to run. And you got brothers and sisters in Christ who should care enough about you that they want to help you and encourage you to grow. And they're going to see areas where maybe there's some room for some, uh, some encouraging words or some, uh, some words that don't feel too nice. Maybe there's actually a verse. Let me read this one to you. It says in Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another towards acts of love and good works. That's the NLT version. Your version probably says to spur one another on towards love and good works. If you're not sure what that means to spur someone on, you know, when a cowboy had their cowboy boots on back in the days, they'd have a, a spur in the back. And I don't know if it's back in the day, they probably still do. You know, you know, ranchers, whatever, they got a spur on the back of their boot and it's got little spikes on it. And the reason they have that is because if they're sitting on a horse and the horse is like, I'm not going nowhere, right? You spur it. You stick that little spike into the back hindquarters of its leg and the horse says, "Woo! I don't like that. I'm going to start moving. I don't want that to happen again. And scripture says that we ought to spur one another on. Sometimes the things that we need to say and do to lovingly encourage each other they don't feel very nice. Like, that wasn't very nice. But sometimes somebody, a brother or sister in Christ, just needs to say, hey, you know that thing you're doing? It's really not good for your growth. Or, hey, that thing you're not doing? God really wants you to step into that so you can become more like Jesus. And we can help each other grow. Healthy families help each other grow. And by the way, we shouldn't do that from a place of abuse or neglect if a, if a family uh, utilizes abuse or neglect, that's not a healthy family. That's a really unhealthy family. And in, in Ephesians 4.29, it says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. All right, here's the fifth thing that healthy families have in common. We're going to wrap up with this. We don't have a final song today, so I'm going to share this, and we're going to pray. Um, But don't miss this one. Healthy families, number five, they stick together. This one's really hard to hear for a lot of people because you're thinking of someone right now. You're thinking, man, my family is not sticking together. We have a really hard time being around each other. There's, I would say that that's an example of an unhealthy family relationship because in a healthy context, your family is going to stick together. When someone messes up, you're like, hey, they messed up, but they're still my brother. When someone does something, they, and I, I loaned you a thousand bucks, you never paid it back, but, you know, you're my brother, you're my sister. We're, we're going to stick together no matter what. It says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in time of need. You hear the loyalty in that language. Or in 1 John 4.20, it says, if a friend says, or someone says, I love you, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? In other words, within the body of Christ, if you're unable to stick together, if you've got a brother or sister in Christ, you're like, man, I hate them. Scripture has a pretty harsh warning against that. How can you claim to love Jesus, who you can't see, when you have people in your family that you can see, and you're not willing to to do whatever it takes to restore your relationship? If you want more information on how that looks and what you should do and how that works, go back to last week's message and watch it. Number five, when we say healthy families stick together, Last week, we did a message called A Church Unified. And if you want to look what, see what a family that's unified and united together, sticking together looks like, go back and watch last week. Remember in Colossians 3.13, it says, Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. The Lord forgave you, brother and sister. So you need to forgive your brothers and sisters in Christ as well. We need to stick together. Resolve every conflict quickly. Make every effort to maintain that bond of peace, right? 
So as we always do, we wrap up our messages with a, a prayer. And I, I hope right now that you'll pray this prayer in the quietness of your heart. And just ask God, what does he want you to do with this information? Are you treating this church like family? Maybe you're a guest here today. Uh, I'm really, really glad you're here. This doesn't apply to you, but if this is your church, if you're a partner, a regular attender here, do you church? Uh, do you treat this place like family? Do you treat brothers and sisters in Christ like brothers and sisters? I, I want to give you this little thought process. If I was to ask you right now to name the five, the last five messages I preached, some of you, uh, you wouldn't be able to do it. Some of you might be able to open up some notes and look back and be like, all right, I got them right here. I wrote them all down. But if I were to ask you to name five people who've made a, an impact in your life, you'd be able to tell me five people. You'd be able to tell me what they did, when they did it, and how impactful it was and how they changed. You'd be able to tell me all about it. Because the truth is, right, your life is not shaped by information. It's shaped by relationships. And you got to be part of God's family. You don't have to be a part of the church to be a Christian. When I look at the, what, what does the Bible say it takes to be a Christian? I, I don't see becoming a partner at a local church. But I will tell you this. You are not going to be a growing Christian, a thriving Christian, a fruit producing Christian. If you choose to try to do your Christian life alone. Because Jesus said that Peter is this rock, and on that rock, that Jesus is going to build a church, and he tells you to be a part of it. And so if you want to be a growing, thriving, fruit-producing Christian, you need to be a part of this family. If not this family, the, the Capital C Church is really big. There's a lot of incredible churches in this community. You need to find one and get plugged in to the family of Christ. You need to. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this opportunity we've had as a family to open up your word together and to study it together and to tether the, the, the just in, in fellowship, to tether the Holy Spirit that's in each of us, to just pull it out of us, to, to know that you're present in this space as we worship you through song, as we worship you through communion, as we worship you through giving, as we worship you through learning. Father, it's incredible to be able to do that with brothers and sisters in Christ. I ask that you would remind us and show us what it is that you want us to do so that we can treat each other more like family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.